Let's pray together. God, you've blessed us in so many ways. We thank you for all the wonderful things you do for us. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus. We know without him we couldn't be your people. We wouldn't have access to you. We wouldn't have a, a high priest who loves us and knows what we go through. We pray, Father, that as we study Hebrews, that you would open our hearts, that your word can soak in and touch us inside. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. you join me in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in the first chapter today. Um, I know some of y'all watched uh, elsewhere, looked at the, the uh, study that we did last week, and we were in Hebrews uh, 10, and that may seem a little out of place, but that's where we need to start Hebrews, this was in chapter 10, because we get a taste of the reason for the writing, <clears throat> the cause for the, the book to be put down for, for Christians to read. All biblical books are situational. They address a specific situation in the, the body of Christ, in uh, the, the people that are the original readers. So even the Old Testament is written to people who are about to go through something or are going through something or have gone through something, and they need <clears throat> help from God. So the Holy Spirit guides a writer to write those things, and, and the Holy Spirit knows this is valuable for the church for, for the future, and so he preserves it. And when we face things that are like that, when we face situations that are, are similar to what they went through, that have an analogy there, we can apply the teaching from that biblical work to our own lives, and it's helpful. <clears throat> so, for instance, if you grew up in Judea in the synagogue and you uh, are found out about Jesus and maybe you even saw some of his miracles and you knew this is, this is the Son of God. He is God come in the flesh, and you begin to be a follower of his. But your family still goes to the synagogue. Well, in a few years, they get tired of you doing this Christian thing. And they start saying things like, you're having way too much fellowship with Gentiles. You got to cut that out. That's not right. You're not doing the things of the law, the way the traditions of our elders say to do them. You need to cut that out. You need to come back. And Matthew sits down and writes a gospel specifically to you. And he, he makes it very Jewish. If y'all remember when Moses was a baby, there was a king that wanted to kill him so that he wouldn't lose his power. When Jesus was a baby, there was a king that wanted to kill him. Moses led people out of Egypt to get away from King Herod as a baby. Jesus went to Egypt. And then God can say, out of Egypt I called my son. And the first time he says that, he's talking about Israel. The second time he says that, he's talking about his son come in the flesh, son of God. And Moses goes up on a mountain and gets Ten Commandments, or after getting the Ten Commandments, gets the law from God, and Jesus goes up on a mountain and sets down and gives law as God. It's similar, but Jesus is always better and on top. And so that gospel's written to you. And any time we're called to abandon Jesus, we ought to hang on to one of those stories. Well, Hebrews is like that, because Hebrews is written to uh, Jewish Christians to remind them to hold on to Jesus. And there's lots of temptations that it's easy to get off track and to start thinking something else is very important and we really need to understand it to be the people of God. For instance, a few years back when I was a, a young minister, it got very popular to talk about angels. Do y'all remember that? Do y'all remember books written about angels and preachers preaching about angels and talking about angels? And some folks figured out... <clears throat> what the order and the promotions that you get as an angel are. And um, they, they knew the names of lots of angels and what their responsibilities were and what their histories were. And um, I've read this book cover to cover, and there are some angels that are in it, but I couldn't find most of the stuff in those books. 
wonder why it's not there. Probably because it's not needed to be a person of God. It's not a requirement. It's not something that we're, that our soul's relationship with our God has, is, requires us knowing about those things. So we need to, to pay attention to stuff that can pull us off and take us into something else. There are lots of different emphasis in the Bible that are <clears throat> smaller than Jesus. Some of them minuscule compared to him. They're just tiny little things. And sometimes religion makes them into big things. And when it does, we need to come back to the big thing that the Bible makes, and that's Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's um, read through the first four verses. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification from sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. This is real important and this one sounds like some other books in the Bible. The themes that begin in Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 are some of the same themes that begin in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. They're very similar. They're doing some of the same things. He says, For a long time God spoke to our ancestors through prophets. Um, we make a distinction between Moses and Elijah because Moses is a lawgiver and Elijah is a prophet. <clears throat> not, not actually. Actually, Moses is a prophet. Moses speaks about God will send you a prophet like who? Moses says, like me. He'll send you a prophet like me, and you must listen to him. Well, Moses is classifying himself as a prophet. Yes, he has a hand in getting the law to the people, but he is a prophet. And God has spoken through the prophets uh, to people, and he's done it in lots of ways. He's, he's used uh, all kinds of illustrations and and. Sometimes the prophets are acting out the message of God. You know, don't change your clothes for the next six months. That'll get everybody's attention, so they don't. You know, and if you can imagine what it must have been like if you got pushed to the front row at that church and the prophet's proclaiming the word of God and he hadn't bathed in a long time. So these are these are ways God spoke through the prophets and... and um, let his word come to the, to the people of God. Look in verse 2. What time is it when the Hebrews is written? It says, in these last days. In these last days. Biblically, everything after the resurrection of Jesus is last days. This is more about your study in some other places in the Bible than it is about your study in Hebrews. But I want you to know biblically, when you read last days, don't think about the six months or year or two years before Jesus returns. That's one of the ways you know a person who's proclaiming the Word of God to you hasn't spent much time in the Word of God is when someone tries to expound the book of Revelation 
and they say last days and they're talking about right before the lord comes back and biblically last days is everything after the resurrection and maybe after the coming of jesus depending on how the word words are used but we've been in last days for two thousand years now last days goes on and on because it's the last giving of God's direction and his hope for the world and the plan of salvation is complete and all that's lacking now is his return to take his people home with him <clears throat> everything else is be behind us and so these are last days and he he puts it there he said now in these last days God has spoken through his son whom he appointed as heir of all things. This isn't a strange concept to us. <clears throat> You've looked at the Great Commission before. You have quoted it to people. You've reminded each other of it. You know, when Jesus tells his apostles, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? To him. He says to me. It's been given to Jesus. He has authority over everything. He's the heir of everything. Everything is in his hands. It's in his control. It's, he's in charge of it. Well, here he's declaring that God has made him heir of everything. And remember in John 1, and through him he made the universe. There are people who come and usually knock on your door and they've got a bunch of pamphlets they're selling and they want to talk about religion. And the great problem I have with their doctrine, the biggest problem I have with them, is they declare that Jesus is a created being and he's less than the Father. He is, he is A and then little g God. He is a spiritual being but he was created by the Father. No. Again and again and again, the Bible declares that Jesus makes the world. Colossians 1, John 1. Genesis. Genesis says, let us make man in our image. God, Father, God, Son, God, Spirit are involved in that creation and Hebrews is declaring, unless you want to throw John and Hebrews and Colossians and Genesis out of your Bible, and I promise you we can find other places that this is discussed and this is pointed to and, and directed to, Jesus is our creator. And it is appropriate to worship and honor and glorify our creator. Through him, he also made the universe. John said, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. It is, it is tracking on the same, um, same principle here. Verse 3, he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. This is the same kind of language you run into in Colossians chapter 1. I would invite you this week to read Colossians 1, read the prologue to John, read that first long section of the Gospel of John that will help you put these things in mind and solidify them. What Hebrews is, is not saying, he is a small copy of God. He is the exact representation. What did, what did Jesus say in John 14 to his disciples? They're all upset because he's leaving them. And they don't want him to go away. They want to see the Father. And they say, Sh just show us the Father and that'll be enough. And he says, you've seen me, so you've seen... Y'all are awake, right? You've seen him. You know me, you know him. He is the exact representation of the Father. You want to know what God is like, what the Father is like? Read about, read about his son. Read about Jesus. That is sort of true in our families. Have you ever met a son that looked just like his dad? 
Guys, have you ever done something and thought, that was just like my dad? Have you ever thought that? And sometimes in our life, we're upset by that, you know? Can't believe I'm acting just like my dad, you know? And other times, we're like, look at that. I'm acting like my dad, you know? It's sort of true in our family. It is completely in his, because Jesus says, if you know me, you know him. He is the exact representation of him. He is the radiance of God's glory. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. The word of God has power in itself. Um, when he makes a command, when he directs something, when he says something will be, it's as good as done because God's word has authority and power. How did we get light? God said, let there be light, and there was. How did we end up with clouds and oceans? God said, let the waters separate. How did we end up with dry land? Well, there was volcanoes, and, and uh, the plates were rubbing against each other, and some of them pushed up, and some sunk down. And No, God said, let the dry land appear, and it does. Let the skies be filled with birds and the fish filled with sea. Let the ground be covered with, with animals. He says those things. His word has power. So the elevation of Jesus, he is not only creator, he is also sustainer by his powerful word. His word is powerful and it exists because he made it and it continues because he sustains it. We were in John a few weeks ago, and John had an argument with the Jewish leaders. He did something on the Sabbath day he wasn't supposed to do. He healed a man and told him to take his mat and walk. And Jesus' argument against them was this. My father is at work today, on the Sabbath day. And all the Jewish leaders agreed. God works on the Sabbath they know he works on the Sabbath because the sun comes up on the Sabbath. They have air to breathe. Their wind blows. The tides come in and go out. How many other ways can we say God is working? Because God is sustaining his universe. Ask a scientist why that happens. They will not tell you why. They will tell you how. Because the answer to why is God. And how does not answer why. They may think it does, but it doesn't answer that question. And the answer is God. God sustains our world. Hebrews is telling us his son is God. His son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of him. Through him he made the universe. His powerful word sustains everything and, makes, and keeps it going. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We're going to have to jump ahead. We're going to spend a good bit of time in Hebrews in the tabernacle and the temple. But I need to remind you of the furniture that's there so you'll understand what's What's going on? You come into the temple court, and there's a big, big altar. It's bronze. It's made for burnt offerings. Then there's a, a big bowl of water, big giant laver of water. Priests are washing in it. They get messy and dirty, and not only that, but ceremonial guilt is outside in the camp and in the people in the land around them, and they're about to go into the presence of God. So they wash before they go in. Then there's a building or a, a tent with a roof on it, not just a courtyard. And there's a, a door or a curtain there that they come through. And if you're offering your sacrifice, you might get a glimpse into the holy place. Inside the holy place is on one side a table of bread, showbread. And it's a reminder of the presence of God. On the other side is a lampstand. God enlightens and guides and leads in the wilderness, 
<clears throat> it is important in the subtle land, it becomes a reminder of God's leadership to the land and his presence in that pillar of fire at night, guiding them. God always enlightens his people. Those are on the sides. Behind that is a, or further on in, is a altar of incense, and it's right up against a curtain. The curtain has cherubim woven into it. Sometimes it's called the veil. You may read that in older translations. That curtain has the, the beings of revelation woven into it. Those, those, those animals that, and beings that have eyes all over them, wings all over the place, and can see everything, they're, they're the guardians of God's holiness. And they're woven into this curtain. They're not little cherubs, not little naked babies with wings. These are scary critters that you don't want to mess with. And this, they're woven in as a reminder, God's holiness is protected. If you're in that room, you're a priest, and beyond that curtain is the holy of holies. This is holy place. This is the most holy place. Behind that, is a, behind that curtain is the Ark of the Covenant with two more cherubim. Imagine that, four cherubim woven into the curtain and on the Ark. And they're Wings are spread forward toward each other, and they're looking down at the lid. Is on that lid is the mercy seat. That's where the high priest comes once a year with the blood of a goat to atone for the sins of the people, and he's going to sprinkle it on that mercy seat. Is there any furniture that's missing? A table, a lamp curtain you ladies decorate houses is there anything missing no place to sit down. there's no chair there's no place to sit down thank you joel no place to sit down how come nobody ever sits down in this house priests come in why are they in the holy place to burn incense trim wicks and put oil in the lamp to replace the showbread. There, there's no setting down here. They're always, when they go into the holy of holies, it's in and out. Go in, sprinkle the blood, get out of there before you die. You're in the presence of a holy God. You are not holy. But I want you to notice what Jesus does. After he made purification for sin, that priest has got two goats. One of them he had sent off into the wilderness as a scapegoat. It's carrying the sins away. One metaphor for getting rid of sin, sending it away. Another is dying. The other goat dies. Its blood is caught and goes in. It goes into the Holy of Holies, to the mercy seat, the place where the presence of God is over that ark. And he sprinkles that blood. He's making the people pure. He's making them at one with God. If, if you don't know what atonement means, that I know that's really, really ghetto to explain it that way, but... It, it does a fairly decent job of explaining atonement to slow it down and say at one moment. Atonement. At one moment. We become one with God again. Sin is not in between us. But Jesus doesn't go in, sprinkle the blood, and go out. If I was a Jew... In the camp in Israelite with the Israelites, and I saw the high priest going in with that blood, I would think, ah, oh, we're cleansed. I know I would think that because I remember the day at Baker Heights that I died and they buried my sinful person in water, and I was raised by the power of God to a new life. Romans 6. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, I'm right. I'm good. I'm cleansed. Unlike 
me after that rebirth, new birth, new life decision. An Israelite in the camp the next day is going, 364 years till I can feel clean again. Because we sin. Does anybody in here sin? Do y'all sin? Yay. We got a hand really high up. All right. Then we have a couple liars in here. Yeah. We sin. We need atonement. The priest goes in once a year and leaves. Jesus sat down. He sat down. It's fall in Texas, and there, there were some people who got to play games, and apparently God called a couple of them off uh, Friday night. But there were some teams that sometime in the middle of the game, the players that started the game and where the main players for the team got to sit down because it was done. The game went on. Some other boys got to play. They got to get in there and get some experience and, and learn some things, but it's a wonderful thing when you're playing a game to get to sit down because you're done. Jesus sits down because we are purified by his death. And he sits down at the majesty of God at the right hand of the majesty of God because he has a right to be there. Why does the high priest go in and leave? He's got sin. He has a life outside. That's not his place. He's there because God called him out and God said, I'll pretend like you're okay as you come in. But Jesus has a right to be there. He is the exact representation of the Father. He is the radiance of God's glory. He made the universe. At the presence of the majesty of God is where he's supposed to be. Oh, preacher, you're crazy. This, you're pulling something out of Revelation the Bible doesn't. Have you read Revelation chapter 5? The angelic beings sing the same words to the lamb, to the lion of the tribe of Judah. In case you don't know who that is, that's Jesus. Sings the exact words to him that it sings to the father on the throne in chapter 4. He's God like the Father. So he sits down. Hebrews is going to make a big deal of this. But there's the appetizer, the introduction, okay? Verse 4. He became as much superior to angels. When you, when you lay out his story, they got no comparison. There's nothing about them that compares with Jesus. Don't, don't confuse them. His, he is as much superior to the angels as the name that he has is superior to theirs. Angel is a representative of God. Jesus is of what God? Son of God. There is a massive difference between a servant and a son. Y'all remember the, the story of the, the tenants that wouldn't pay their rent? Remember that story that Jesus told? And he kept sending messengers, and they were killing them and, and not paying their rent. And he said, well, I'll send my son. They'll respect him. When the son got there, what did they think? If we kill him, we'll get the, we'll get the it'll be ours. We'll be the heirs. Son's superior. What he has in his control is greater. His name is greater. So he says in, in chapter 1, verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say? Now, he's going to do something here. That introduction, that, that prologue reminds me of John, and I start thinking, maybe John wrote Hebrews. 
And now he's going to do something Paul does because Paul likes to pile on Old Testament quotes to people who know the Old Testament and doesn't have to tell them the chapter and verse. He, they, they know he was talking from the Old Testament. Paul likes to pile those up so to make his point. And Hebrews is about to do something very much like Paul. So when I get to reading through the rest of the chapter, I'm thinking, I bet it was Paul that wrote Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. It doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit said, this is inspired. This writer was guided by me, and he's writing something that is eternally valuable to the church. So he says, verse 5, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. This is from Psalms. It's Psalms 2. It is a psalm, uh, a royal psalm of a king becoming a leader of Israel and God claiming him as a son. But it's more accurately applied to Jesus as son of God. And he said, he never said that about angels, but he said it about Jesus. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Again, this is in 2 Samuel. All this is from the Old Testament. Verse 6, again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever. The scepter, a scepter of justice will be a scepter, will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with, hope, with oil of joy. He says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same. Your years will never end. And to which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? All angels do some really marvelous, cool stuff. They're amazing. They're not the Son. They're not Jesus. That comparison doesn't hold up. The things that are similar are very small compared to the things that are different. He's better than angels. He's better than angels. <clears throat> if you could have 15 minutes with Gabriel, would you talk to him? Would you skip out on your 15-minute conversation with Jesus to talk to Gabriel? I hope not a chance, because he's the Son of God. Sit at my right hand. What's the deal about right hand? We've had that twice in this chapter. He's sitting at the right hand of God in majesty. What's the deal about the right hand? I'm kind of a security guy. I'm always thinking, hmm, what, what's he doing? What are they up to? I got that from my dad, and he was a Marine. That's where he got all his parenting skills, was from the Marine Corps. So um, we kind of grew up in a different house. There were four boys, so he was trying to make godly men out of us. and He, he made a passing grade. He got a 75. Got three-fourths of it done. 
Um, in ancient times, you didn't defend with a gun. You defended with a sword. And I want you to imagine I'm sitting down right now, okay? The guy on my left, I can draw my sword and do something to him. The guy on my right, it's really hard to attack this direction. Does that make sense? Well, that guy, you've absolutely got to trust him. Because you can't defend yourself from him very well. Your right-hand man has to be good with you and tight with you. Okay? Again, this is another reason, and most people don't know about this, but when you're, when you're um, ushering a lady at a wedding, you put out your left arm. Okay? How come? Oh, no, it's the right one. No, it's, it's left. It's what it's supposed to be. Because you need to be able to draw your sword and defend her honor with your right hand. That's where that all came from. It all goes back to some very ancient practices. Right hand is a place of, of respect and honor and trust. And at the right hand of God, means he is trusted completely, it really fits the description Jesus gives of his relationship with his father in John chapter 14. So here he is sitting at the right hand of God because he's the person with all the authority and all the power and very much respected and, and known to be um, trusted by the Father. We have a minute and a half if you have any questions. I've talked the whole time, and I know you all are used to discussion. Um, sometimes I've got too much to say to give you any time, but you got a minute and a half. You have a question? There's some key words like that that, that some uh, interpreters want to glom onto. He became. He wasn't that before, but he became. Um, n no. And there's a reason I say no, because in some passages that are doing the same thing this does, like John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was... The word. I got I to get this correct. I'm sorry. I'm going the wrong direction. I was going to the beginning for me. This is the beginning for y'all, isn't it? We go right to left. Is that correct? Okay. So you got this timeline here, okay? Let's imagine right here is when God said, let there be light. And my podium there is where Jesus died on the cross. And we are... Three seats the other side of that, okay? Is this the beginning when Jesus created the heavens and the earth? Is that the beginning? Raise your hand. Okay? I, I would be with you. I would say that's the beginning, okay? But let's imagine you want to make the beginning four million years before God created the heavens and the earth. Is this the beginning? Okay, I'll let you let that be the beginning. The word was. Already, past tense, pre-existing. Jesus, God come in the flesh, has always been. And John goes on and says, the word was with God, and the word was God. Always with him, always him, always the same, always God. So, became is a term that is used of the story. I know more so than the Old Testament prophets that Jesus is God because he walked on water. Because he claimed to be one with the Father. Because he said before Abraham was, we're going to get to this in a few weeks in John, before Abraham was, I am. And they went to pick up stones to stone him for claiming to be God, and he didn't correct them. But I know more than with anything else that he is God come in the flesh 
because he died and he's alive, never to die again. Um, the became is a term of the narrative of the account. It's as if we got a clearer vision of him than we had before. So he's become that in our eyes. It's not he wasn't that and he became that. It's that's part of the, the narrative of who we see him as. Does that make sense? Okay. Appreciate y'all's attention, and thank you so much. We'll be in Hebrews 2 um, next week. And please be thinking Old Testament, and if you get a chance to read some of that Old Testament stuff, especially in the law and uh, places like uh, Numbers and, and where they're, they're putting together the people of God and, and, and organizing the, the worship there. I appreciate y'all's attention. Thank you.